Garda, for those of you who haven't met before, I'm one of the cardiologists here based at Gold Jubilee. Uh, Mark and I are going to talk about the various heart failure based research projects that we have. But really, we couldn't do it without the, the team that we have around us. Uh, I remember when we first started doing heart failure research, I did it without heart failure research and our support. And actually, looking back, I have no idea how we, we managed it at all. But our team looks like this. I'm sorry if it doesn't project particularly well at the back, but Mark and I <coughs> do a number of heart, base, heart failure based research projects. We have the research fellows panel here on the left hand side, supported by the wonderful Marion McCann and Shane McKee. And we're delighted to say that we've actually just appointed two more research nurses uh, to our team, so that's, that's going to help us greatly expand our por portfolio. I have a regional heart failure clinical nurse, Kirsty McGovern, who is also involved in some of the research projects that we do. Relatively uniquely, we have a research <coughs> physiologist as well, sponsored by Boston Scientific, and that's been in place for a good two or three years now. We have a research fellow, sponsored by St. Jude Medical, and we also have clinical fellows in the ward who are involved in research projects. But of course, our team expands beyond the Jubilee, and there are a number of collaborators that we have based both at the University of Glasgow, University of Edinburgh, and so on and so forth, and then the names are illustrated here. In terms of things that we're interested in, this is quite a busy map, but this is the way my brain works. We think about heart failure, which is a syndrome as well, and it's a big problem, and at least half a million people in the UK have it at any one point. Perhaps, and if you look at some of the epidemiological work, nearly as many as a million people might have heart failure. So it is a big problem, and a massive drain on the NHS. Annual expenditure of heart failure is about £2.2 billion pounds per year, so a big problem. And the various areas that we're interested in are in terms of the diagnosis and prognosis of heart failure, but also in potential treatments. And one of my main areas of interest is in device-based research, and I'll perhaps illustrate a few of those uh, shortly. In terms of the current projects that uh, I've got running at the moment, we've got a couple of drug-based studies. Uh, the Paragon HF study is a, a new drug called Secubitol Valsartan, that I'm sure many of you are aware has been shown to be superior to ACE inhibitor therapy in the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now one of the troubles is there are individuals who have preserved ejection fractions so the heart contracts normally but it's stiff. Okay? But we don't know how to manage these individuals particularly well. In fact, no treatment has been shown to be a benefit in those individuals. So we are looking at this new drug as part of the Paragon HF study. The treatment of acute decompensated heart failure hasn't really changed very much in the last 20 years or so. In fact, it's still the same as it was when I was in medical school. So one of the studies we're about to embark on is called STEALTH, which is a fantastic name for a clinical study, and it's looking at something that activates mitochondria. So that's hopefully something we're going to be starting in the new year. In terms of device-based strategies, I'm sure many of you are aware about CRT. I do have some slides later on showing you what CRT is, but it's a device that can improve the way that people feel when they have heart failure, but also make them live longer. In clinical studies, it's been shown to reduce the chance of patients dying by about a third. So it's an important treatment, but we do appreciate that around about 30% of patients who get CRT don't get better. So many of the treatment options that we have in terms of research are trying to work out how we can make that response rate better. Cardiomems. I do have a couple of slides on cardiomems. It is a fantastic little device that measures pulmonary artery pressure. So perhaps the pulmonary vascular unit would be interested in it as well. We'll come back to that in a second. Vagal nerve stimulation is something that's been tried in a number of fields of medicine and most recently heart failure. And it is a study we've recently completed. Sadly, it doesn't work. And of course, one of the issues in terms of putting metal work in people's chests is that traditionally they haven't been able to get MRI scans. So we've been involved in a number of studies looking at <coughs> the safety of these devices in an MRI environment, starting with Tendril MRI, which is not illustrated here, which is pacemakers, and now it's pretty routine for us to scan patients with a pacemaker in situ. And more recently, we were the first in the world to recruit to a ready MRI. And that's where we put people with a suit. <coughs> ICD in an MRI environment, and we said we would recruit five, and in fact recruited 12, so we did well there. We're about to embark on a study looking at biomarkers. We previously did this with a company called Alir, uh, so the company we're going to be working with is part of the novel study. And this is trying to work out point of care as a diagnostic marker and potentially a prognostic marker. 
But really, from a financial point of view, it is a big money spinner for us because it helps us employ and fund the nurses that we have as part of our service. And finally, and there's a poster number seven which you can go and look at during the lunch break, but I will mention the ILAC project that we're embarking upon. So we tend to take on device studies that potentially could make a difference to patients. I've mentioned already ready MRI, in fact, our recruitment rate is 410%. So I think what we've realised is when we tell them a number that we'll recruit to, we start actually with a conservative number and over-recruit. It looks a lot better than giving them an ambitious number and under-recruiting. More CRT, again, this is to talk about the response rate of CRT and adapt response. And again, in each of these instances, we've over-recruited, uh, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. So CRT looks a bit like this. This is the heart silhouette here. There's a lead in the right atrium. There's a lead in the right ventricle. And we paste the left ventricle via the vein that goes around the back of the heart, called the coronary sinus. As I said, it's been shown to reduce mortality by just over a third. So this is an important treatment, and actually quite an inexpensive treatment. But they say internationally around about 3 out of 10 patients don't respond to CRT. And actually, in our experience, our success rate is much better than that, but I think it's because we prioritise the patients most likely to benefit from CRT. But there's a study called More CRT. We've already recruited 28 patients uh, to the clinical study. And as well as stimulating the right ventricle and the left ventricle simultaneously to improve cardiac function, we have the option of stimulating multiple parts of the left ventricle and the right ventricle in the hope that we will get extra improvement in cardiac function. Now, from a scientific point of view, I'm sure they're disappointed with us because, in fact, the vast majority of our patients have responded to CRT and are therefore exited from the study. So it's good news for the patients, bad news for this technology because all our patients get better. But this is what it looks like on an X-ray. So this is from the front, there's the device here, you've got a defibrillator lead here, right atrial lead, and you can just see this lead going around the back of the heart with four dots on it. And essentially we can stimulate the heart in to up to 17 different directions with this device and multiple positions from here to here and here to here to try and recruit more of the left ventricle. Now in the right hand panel you can actually see this is a lateral view and I love lateral views for looking at device therapy because it illustrates things far more nicely. You've got the building blocks of the spine here and the front of the chest here. As we all know the right ventricle goes to the front. So there's the right ventricle lead and you can just see the LV lead right on the back of the heart. And if you stimulate it back in the front together, it hopes you improve cardiac function. But of course, devices do more than just pace and shock. There's a number of other things that they can do. They can actually tell you how active a patient is. They can talk about thoracic impedance to try and work out if somebody's decompensating. There was a study relatively recently that looked at thoracic impedance, and what it did is it increased hospitalisation by a third. Because as soon as it gave, up, gave an alert, the knee-jerk reaction was to admit the patient. So we need a much better system in which to try and work out which patients are going to do badly. And we were involved in a study called the Multisense study that's now finished. But in fact, we were involved uh, as our centre here with our colleagues in the States developing the algorithm for this device. And this CRT-based device looks at a number of different parameters, including thoracic impedance, but it can also listen to heart sounds, it can look at respiratory rate, tidal volume, how propped up somebody is in bed, and we all know that heart failure patients, when they're struggling, are getting using more and more pillows, they put bricks under the bed to raise it, so this device can tell us that they're doing that. And it gives you something that looks like this, which is hideous, and nobody wants to look at this sort of thing and try and work out what's going on. But patients that decompensate, their thoracic impedance is falling, their respiratory rate is going up, their tidal volume is falling, and there's a new index, this is an algorithm that we've got now called Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. But ultimately, the platform is going to look like something like this, and it's going to give you a composite index and a score and an alert system. But what I've been very keen to try and engage with companies, the problem is that the vast majority of these devices are followed up by device physiologists who are looking at rhythms, they're looking at thresholds, they're not used to looking after heart failure patients. And I think we have to have an environment where somebody sensible that knows about heart failure based strategies interprets those data. So it's a clue as to what's going on with the patient that we need a sensible uh, reaction to the data that produced. I mentioned CardioMems. This is a CardioMems device. It's roughly about a centimetre in length. It looks like a little piece of plastic with two nitinol wings. And it's embolised into the pulmonary artery. Now, this thing doesn't have a battery. 
what happens is it records pulmonary artery pressure on a beat to beat aspect. And it can tell us if patients are developing pulmonary hypertension, if people are overloaded. Amazingly, this device can also measure cardiac output. The deployment time takes about seven minutes, but the big problem with this device is this thing doesn't make people feel better unless you intervene upon those data that come costs £12,000. Now, it does correlate very well with pulmonary artery pressure, and as I say, it can measure cardiac output as well. And in the, the Champion study using this device in the States, it did reduce hospitalisation by about a third. But of course, the healthcare system they have in the States is very different to the healthcare system we have here in the UK. And quite rightly, NICE and other bodies said, well, actually what we want is UK-based data. And if you get UK-based data, it makes a difference to our heart failure patients, and perhaps we might consider this as a, an option for heart failure patients. And so a UK cardiomem study has been proposed. It's a multi-centre UK study. We are the only centre in Scotland that's been approached by this, and they wish 10 patients to be recruited. But of course, as this device is C-marked, they also want us to pay the £120,000 to buy their device to run their study. And we went, have you met the NHS before? This sort of thing doesn't happen. And I'm delighted to report in the last couple of weeks that they're now going to be giving us them free. So this is really good. So this is something that we will hopefully be starting at some point next year. This is really quite an attractive technology, particularly for the transplant referral patients who are getting right heart catheters done sometimes on a weekly basis. This device, once sterilized, will tell us everything we want to know. Quite exciting, really. I'll touch on the novel study. This is a biomarker based uh, research study. They are giving us £100 for every blood sample we take. And the hope is that we'll get roughly about half a million pounds from this study. This is one of the BNPs that we checked originally with the original group. That's my BNP, in fact, which says I'm going to be immortal, which is great. We want to be here forever. And really, I wanted to finish on the project that I'm most excited about, and that's why patients with heart failure die. Now, <coughs> the mortality rate in heart failure is very significant. Uh, we don't know fully why patients with heart failure die. Is it a rhythmic death? Is it pump failure death? Is it something else? Is it pulmonary embolism? Is it a stroke? And so, therefore, we've been working with St. Jude Medical, and this looks massive, but it's just over three centimetres in length. It's about the size of a couple of matchsticks. And this is a device that we place underneath the skin, in the chest, and a bit like this, we local anaesthetic, little nick of the skin, and it's improvised using a syringe. We then use a steady strip to close, it doesn't involve a stitch, and it downloads via a mobile phone on a daily basis. And it's going to tell us everything to do with our heart rhythm, whether it's fast, whether it's slow, whether we get atrial fibrillation. It can also tell us a number of exciting things, which I'll maybe touch on in a second before I hand over to Laura. But we aim to recruit 500 patients. Uh, we'll identify them initially in Queen Elizabeth Hospital in NIH, and patients who were admitted with decompensated heart failure, and invite them to take part in the study, and follow them up for the average length of the device battery, which is about 2.75 years. And we're only going to contact them by telephone every quarter just to make sure they're okay and they're complying with the downloads. And at the end of the study, we'll see who's alive, who's been hospitalised, and try and look at the rhythm burden that these individuals have had. Now, what can we capture? Well, apart from tachycardia, bradycardia, we can also see AF, how much are they having, how fast is it. But this tiny little couple of matchstick device can also listen to heart sounds, we can also see how propped up people are in bed. You can also see how fast they're breathing and what the tidal volume is. It can do a number of other things. It can also measure temperature, so core temperature. So people who are admitted to heart failure, sometimes that's because of sepsis, so this device can identify that too. So there are a number of very interesting things we aim to capture. And we're also hopeful to recruit a subset of individuals to a post-mortem study. We clearly have to die for that to happen, <laughs> but it would be nice to correlate post-mortem findings with rhythm burning as well. And as part of that, we can test the urine and the recently departed to see if they've actually been taking their tablets. <coughs> so, a lot to do. Now, we've achieved a lot since we started doing this project at the start of January. The device is not CE marked, it's been uh, submitted for CE marking, we hope to find out this month. So, we would hope to start in the first quarter of 2017. In terms of funding, it's always difficult to achieve. The devices have been given to us by St. Jude, so that's a million pounds worth of devices because they're two grand each. Uh, Simon, I'm delighted to say, is the second 
our British Society for Heart Failure Fellow. The first was also a Glasgow Fellow, Jenny Cannon, who's currently our clinical fellow. So we've kept it very much Glasgow. Ross Diagnostics are giving us the biomarkers, and as soon as it's CU marked, we can apply for EHF funding, hopefully to pay for the sub-study, which is the post-monitor <coughs> sub-study. So, so far, from my point of view, including the ILR thing, we've got uh, heart failure research with a contract of about just over 2 million. We've got six members of staff now in the hospital. We're just about to start, and that, um, these individuals don't cost the hospital anything, so it's great to see, and hopefully these uh, relationships with Boston and St. Jude are ongoing. The nice thing about device-based research is sometimes we get the devices free, so it saves the money, uh, hospital money, but it also gives our patients, particularly for device-based research, the potential for a plan C, another option, because many of these individuals are already at a ceiling of treatment. So with that, I'll stop and hand over to the lovely and beautiful Mark Petrie. <laughs>